one thing to consider if he's intending to buy a new computer for this anyway, is look at the cost differential between the levels of the RAM. It may not be worth trying to stay too small because the price curve is pretty flat below some particular level of RAM. So don't push the RAM value down from what their standard is if it's not gonna save you any money. He looked at, he was, he looked at eight, I believe, and then he looked at 16. And uh, 16 would double, virtually apparently double the price of the computer. So he, he was cool toward that. Okay, folks, so we should be live on YouTube and I just shared the link in the chat here inside Zoom. Give it a try, let me know if it's working. Okay, let me check it up here. I need someone to say something uh, so I can check the audio. Well, I was going to ask Elliot if, if um, does that duplicate the chat on YouTube or? So you sounds like you broke up for a second there, Kurt. I, um, there is a chat on YouTube, and I don't know that we can turn it off. Um, we can we can choose one chat over the other and ask people to to use that. Um, does that duplicate the chat on YouTube or it's a it's a 26, 20 second delay so that we can uh, we can bleep all the four letter words. Yeah, I verified that the uh, sound is coming in properly on YouTube. Now, there so. is a chat on YouTube, and I don't know that we can turn it off. Um, we can we can choose one chat over the other and ask people to, to use that. It's a it's a 26, 20 second delay so that we can uh, we can bleep all the four letter words. Yeah, I verified that the uh, sound is coming in properly on YouTube. There is a chat on YouTube. Do you know how many folks we're going to have on YouTube? Is it going to be a pretty good crowd? No idea. Okay. okay. You know, I looked at YouTube. I didn't see a chat there. I went searching for it on the YouTube. It's a, it's a 26.
if you full screen, it may uh, disappear. Okay. You know, I looked at YouTube. I didn't see a chat there. I went searching for it on YouTube. Elliot, if my audio starts to break up, I'll just, um, they, my other laptop, I don't have video working on it, but the audio seems to work okay on there. So I'll, so we might have to make that decision. Yeah, you just want to quiet up again. Time. But sometimes my audio breaks up on this one. Yeah, I lost uh, maybe a 30 or sentence there. Okay, well, let me log in from my other machine, and I'll just do audio. Okay, okay. I think you can assign a, a still photo of yourself in Zoom if you want to have a something that's not just a gray, a gray box. Okay. All right, well, back in with audio only, which I might have to go with. I'm not sure what my, my problems here are, but hmm. this is a little bit better. Yeah, no, it sounds better. Good.
Okay, I've sent an announcement with the live stream uh, link to uh, the mailing list. Uh, I also uh, sent it out directly to Bill Ricker, and I added it to the, uh, the blue website, both to the home page and to the calendar entry for tonight's meeting. I also did uh, send it uh, also to our RSC channel. So uh, I guess everyone should know it by now. Sounds like somebody's got a bad ground on their uh, either their headphones or their microphone. Yeah, I thought I would mute all when we get started and then people can unmute themselves as needed to ask questions. That usually works pretty well. Oh, okay. Are you referring to that uh, high-pitched whining noise? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I have UPS in my server rack with the batteries uh, complaining that it wants to be changed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let me mute myself and see if it goes away. I have a feeling it might be coming from my speakers. It'll go away as soon as I mute myself. See? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm innocent. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here and get started. And then, Kurt, I assume when you speak, you'll share your screen and someone else will be picking up the, uh, the student cluster presentation. Is that right? Uh, yeah. In fact, I, I just have the URL. So I'll just, I'll just put the URL to my, um, to my presentation in the chat box okay. and then I'll talk over it. And then I think uh, there's, there's four or five folks coming from the BU HPC group and right, two of them right. wanted to talk, but they're not going to take more than 30 minutes, I shouldn't think. Yeah, okay, okay. I'm going to have to leave after a little while. I have another meeting that will be starting. OK, I've got a few windows up on my screen, but I assume all you're seeing is the uh is the, the Chrome window with my slides, hopefully. Yeah, just the slides, it says the agenda.
All right, well, we're at the top of the hour. So we'll get started. I'll, uh, I'll mute everyone. And if you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and chime in. Uh, we don't have terribly too many people on the line here, so I think that'll, that'll work pretty nicely. Um, and I don't know if, if uh, one of you folks on the line has a, has a YouTube tab open, but if someone does indeed um, send some chat questions on YouTube, hopefully one of us will see it and, and can chime in and, and relay. I'll keep muting people as, uh, as they join. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, thanks again for, for being with us this evening. And this is kind of a, a group event. It's the, uh, the Boston Linux and, and Unix users group as well as the, the Boston HPC and GPU meetup group. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll have some interesting cross sections here to talk about. Um, I'm Elliot Eshelman. Uh, my day job is HPC at Microray where we design and, and build uh, on-premise HPC systems. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the recent events now that everything has been virtual. And uh, then we'll have Kurt from MIT and uh, some of the students from BU presenting on the student cluster competitions, which, uh, which typically happen about now in, in uh, June usually, and then in November of each year. So it's certainly different for them this year. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the HPC events that have been happening in these last couple months, all remote. You know, we were all thinking we were gonna get to go travel a little bit this year and it's not looking that way, um, but um, some interesting benefits to this remote is that uh, I think some of us are getting to attend events that we don't usually get to. I don't usually get to attend ISC, uh, which is held in, uh, in Europe. Um, so, you know, uh, some pros and, and some cons, certainly. Um, okay, start, well, I guess we'll start with the, with the obvious. Um, uh, COVID, COVID, COVID. Um, it's, a, it's, yeah, um, maybe an, an unprecedented challenge for, for some of us. Um, and, you know, computers can't, can't solve this problem, but uh, it's been interesting to see just how much the, the HPC community has come together uh, to, to try and tackle some pieces of this problem, what, what can be solved just, um, you know, through computers and through research. Um, so, the, uh, the Riken system Fugaku, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, they came online a little early to help um, with some of the, the computational challenges around COVID-19, as well as most of the, the United States Department of Energy HPC systems, which uh, some of those are not usually very easy to get on, but uh, it, sounds, it seems like all these centers are, are trying to make it a little easier for, for researchers to get compute time if they're working on COVID. Um, same at Argonne, which is another DOE lab. They deployed some of the new NVIDIA systems early so that they could, um, they could have the latest hardware for, uh, for tackling some of this compute. Uh, I know that many, many vendors are participating. I know IBM, Intel, AMD are you know, donating time or resources or, or people hours towards this problem. Um, if, you go, if you go look, there is, a, so it, it's called the COVID-19 HPC Consortium, you'll see. Uh, research centers all over the world that are collaborating and working on this and you can apply for research time. There are software tools you can get for free there. Um, it's really everyone's coming together. And then of course, folding at home, which uh, might be popular for some of you. Um, they, they've been running this too. Um, and it's been interesting to see that work. So they were um, some of the folks um, running the folding at home we're looking at um, the, the COVID molecule early, I think in, in March and, uh, and, and roughing out some of, um, uh, you can tell I'm not a, I'm not a uh, chemist or a biologist, but they were, they were roughing out the, the spike, I believe, and um, uh, the way it, uh, it moves and, and interacts with the human cell. Um, and then um, at ISC, they, they did run a focus session on some of the ways that these different centers are, are helping to, uh, to work on the COVID problem. And uh, I have quite a few links in here, so I'll, I'll share, share my slides later and uh, you can all click through the links. So the, the whole conference is available for free essentially. Um, 
you can go to these links on YouTube and you can watch uh, 140 videos. Some of them are from vendors. Some of them are from HPC centers um, or, or HPC research papers being presented. There's, there's a lot of material. Um, we're, we're all spending a lot of time in front of our computers this year, I know, but um, there's, a, there's a lot of material from this conference and others that you, you have access to. So, so definitely check it out. Um, and one of the sessions you'll, you'll find on there is in regards to what some of the, uh, the, the worldwide centers are, are running uh, as far as uh, trying to tackle, tackle COVID. And I know for ISC in particular, uh, you know, there were still some, some bumps. We're still figuring out some of these remote events and online events. Um, I know it was hard for some people to find the ISC streams and, and some of the registration um, just the, the way the IC webpage worked was a little confusing for me, certainly. I, I had some people tell me they were having difficulty finding what they wanted to find. Um, and I heard from some that the, the time differences were, were a challenge, which of course, if we were traveling, it, obviously we'd have jet lag. But I know there were some people that woke up at 2 a.m. to attend some live sessions. And, uh, and I know there's some, there were some people saying, oh, you know, it was definitely worth it. I had no problem waking up at 2 a.m. Uh, to, to watch a live session, but I know other people that uh, did not work for. Um, and the student cluster competition did indeed occur. Normally, all the students, you know, travel over, they, they lug a whole bunch of gear with them. It's a whole adventure. Um, but this year being remote, um, they were using uh, online computer resources. So kind of like cloud resources to, uh, to do the challenge. So that was, that was different. And it sounds like it will be similar. We'll, we'll hear from them later uh, on the next student cluster challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, ISC running, they still did, uh, go through the, the new list of, of HPC systems. So two times a year, they update these lists with what are the most powerful and most efficient systems. Um, what's particularly unique here is just how well this new system performed. So, um, the institution is named Riken, it's in Japan and their new cluster is called Fugaku. And, um, it's, you'll see in the first bullet point there, it's over 400 petaflops, um, which, you know, if you need a frame of reference, that's, that's more than two times larger than the US's. I think it's nearly three times faster than the US's system, which was number one before this. Um, similarly, it blew everyone else away on HPCG. A lot of people use those first two bullet points as kind of book, bookends on, on the capabilities of, of an HPC system. So having number one on both is very indicative and then, you know, just going down, they, they got number one on Graph 500. They got number one on HPL AI 500. Um, so this is a, this is a, a very well-designed system. Um, and it's a system that doesn't have uh, third-party accelerators, right? It doesn't have like, a, like an FPGA or a GPU in it. Um, so I think we'll be talking more about this. Um, there's a, there's a great guy who's, uh, who's working at Georgia Tech right now who's going to give our, our uh, HPC group a, a presentation in August where he's going to do a deep dive into some of this. Uh, but it, it's a very impressive system. And from the last bullet point here, it's, uh, it's a very efficient system as well um, in that it's uh, close to the top of the list on the green 500, which means um, amount of compute performance per watt consumed. Is, it's very efficient. There seemed to be a little confusion on that though. I saw a couple online publications posting it as like number nine or number seven. I don't know if there were some early numbers that were a little less efficient and then they tightened it up. Um, but this was apparent, this was what was posted during ISC was that it was number four on the green 500. And then turning to some vendor news, um, Intel dropped a new set of CPUs. These are, um, Intel Xeons, which probably most of you have heard about, they're server CPUs. What's different is that they're, they're only made for big systems, four socket and eight socket systems. So you can see here in the diagram, there's four CPUs uh, connected by the Intel UPI link. What's special about these is that they're, they're doubling down on that connection capability. Um, the, the previous Xeons had three links per CPU. And you can see here it has, each CPU has six links going out. So it's doubling the uh, the bandwidth between the CPUs in the system, which, um, which, which is important for efficiency as you're, as you're scaling up. Um, so this makes it easier in particular to get to eight CPUs. And I'll, I'll show that next. Um, it's six, six channels of memory per CPU, quite a bit of PCI Express per CPU. It's uh, Gen 3, which is kind of in some ways uh, one gen back at this point. Um, 
but a lot of a lot of bandwidth, uh, memory bandwidth, PCI bandwidth, and bandwidth between the CPUs. And then this is what uh, an eight, eight socket design would typically look like. So um, this is a pretty big system. Um, just to buy one of these, it's not it's not something even that your your average HPC center will deploy, or maybe they'll deploy a small number of them for specialty applications. There's a group at Harvard doing full earth earthquake simulations that has a system kind of like this. Um, but it, it's a little bit specialty. Um, another interesting bit about this CPU is that it uh, provides bfloat 16 instruction support, which is a bit es esoteric, um, but is used for deep learning. So like apparently Facebook is gonna deploy crazy numbers of this thing for, for deep learning. And the bfloat 16 allows them to uh, do a reduced precision which is not usually acceptable for HPC, but uh, works pretty well for deep learning if it's done right. And uh, on the software side, Intel is continuing with their, their heterogeneous software. So you'll probably hear quite a bit of talk about one API. Um, we had a, a presentation from Intel on it in our group uh, a couple months back. Um, the idea is all these different architectures you see at the bottom of the slide, whether it's a Xeon CPU or an XE GPU, which has been talked about, but you can't buy one yet. And then FPGAs and some of the embedded devices and the, the very uh, specifically designed accelerators for deep learning from Habana. Um, those can all be, you know, they, they all traditionally have had their own programming methods and APIs and you have to do a lot of custom tuning. And the hope here is that, um, Oh, and uh, Sujata shared the link in the chat if you want to have a look at it. Um, the idea is you can you can write to one API and then you'll be able to execute on whichever hardware you, you happen to be running on. Um, and Intel also has something called, called DevCloud. If you want to, um, to try it right now, you can get access in the cloud to some of the uh, the current generation hardware and try out your code, see how it works and, and kind of start getting ready for when the, when the big hardware arrives that has Intel CPUs, GPUs and, and more. Yeah, and another thing I can add over there is um, since our GPUs are not available and uh, since like, you know, cross platform is one of the things that is like, you know, the main uh, goal of one API uh, you can run one API in DPC++ code on NVIDIA hardware today. And uh, there is a workshop happening on that. I can post a link to that. And I don't know, Elliot, if you have announced it to this group as well. Yeah, please do. So there is a link on the front page of our, of our meetup page right now. There's a, there's a link to that Intel event um, later this month. And yeah, if you want to post it in chat as well, Sujata, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, in interesting. Uh, Interesting days. Um, we may have some some time for discussion later. I'd like to hear what what people think. Um, and uh, I have AMD here. They didn't seem to have a lot of news during ISC actually, um, but I thought it was relevant to to mention just some some rough speeds and feeds since they've still been been very active. There's been a lot of interest from the HPC community in their CPUs. Um, they've had a a couple of big wins on on some of the really huge uh, HPC systems in the U.S. Um, so up to 64 cores per CPU, which is up to 120 thre 128 threads per CPU. The clock speeds go up to 3.7 gigahertz, though um, you have to accept a lower core count to hit a clock speed like that. Uh, the, the big 64 core CPUs are usually more like uh, two, two and a half gigahertz. And then um, all CPUs these days will boost to higher speeds if they can. So they'll boost up to 3.9 gigahertz if they can. Um, and those CPUs have good memory bandwidth as well. Um, and they support PCI Express Generation 4, which is, uh, is needed for some people. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll assign homework, homework as we go. Again, I'll, I'll post these slides with the links, um, but there's so many videos you can go watch, hundreds of videos. There's 140 for ISC, and then there's a container workshop. Um, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff going on with containers for those that are interested in that. Um, and if, if you don't know if you're interested, definitely check out containers like Google Docker or Google uh, Singularity. Um, they offer some really interesting capabilities. Um, you don't have to manually install software a lot of times. For most common software, 
you can find a container that's already got an optimized build of the software that you want and you don't have to mess with it anymore. It, it can really make your life easier. Um, and I mean, that can be a single scientific software application. That can be a deep learning application. It can be an entire kind of orchestrated cluster deployment. There's some, some pretty cool stuff going on. Um, if you're doing more traditional HPC uh, software builds, have a look at the SPAC tutorial that's coming up this later this month. Um, SPAC is a tool for automated cluster, or sorry, automated software compilation. Um, so if you're, if you're an HPC user and you're manually compiling code still, um, you, you might be kind of kind of wasting your own time. <laughs> um, it, it's really cool to use some of these new tools that will do automated builds and they're built by uh, really smart people. So you can have confidence in the builds they're doing um, uh, architecture specific builds. So, you know, if you run it on, a, on an Intel Skylake CPU, it will optimize to that CPU and it knows how to build the underlying libraries, open blobs or whatever it is against the, the architecture that you're running in that system. Um, so it's, it's easy and it works well and it runs well. So it's pretty cool. Uh, there's another tool called easy build that, um, that I've had pretty good luck with as well. And then, uh, Jumping over to NVIDIA GTC. Um, so uh, similar to ISC, there's a lot of videos, even more. Um, you, could, you could spend weeks watching all this stuff. Um, so I'd recommend you know, going to the link, searching on what it, whatever it is that you need or you're interested in, and you'll probably find something regardless of what that topic is. Um, there, there's all kinds of stuff. You can, you can dig into the hardware, you can dig into the software or just user applications. There's a, there's a lot lot to dig into. And um, I, I found NVIDIA GTC's event to be a, a, a little, little easier to deal with than ISC. I think that's because they have a bigger team um, and they don't have ISC. They had to kind of uh, herd a lot of cats, right? All the vendors and all the presenters and everything. NVIDIA had, um, they didn't, it was just them. They didn't, they didn't bring in other exhibitors. Uh, so I think it was easier for them to keep a handle on things. Um, but a, a lot of really interesting resources if you're a GPU user. Um, and of course their big drop was the, the new Ampere architecture, which is their latest GPU. It's a couple of years in coming and um, has some interesting capabilities I'll, I'll dig into briefly here and you can certainly read more on later. Um, the highlights are um, it's got great HPC performance. It's nearly 10 teraflops right out of the gate. And with their tensor cores, um, if you're doing uh, the right kind of matrix multiply, I'd say, um, you can essentially double your performance. So if you can leverage those units correctly with uh, your particular math, you can get closer to 20 teraflops, similar for single precision. Um, and NVIDIA has spent several generations now optimizing their performance for, for deep learning training and inference. Um, so depending on what kind of neural network you're training or, or running in for inference, you'll get anywhere from 3x to 20x speed ups over their, their previous generation GPU. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of material available if you want to find out exactly how they're achieving that. They're doing some very interesting optimizations um, with culling sparse matrices, and um, they're actually running compression in the L2 cache. Um, which I don't know if that's done, been done before, it was, but it was interesting to hear about. Um, each GPU has uh, high bandwidth memory. So you're, you're talking to the GPU memory at one and, a half, one and a half terabytes per second, which again is, I think, a little bit unprecedented. Uh, and then they have some interesting new ways to split up each GPU. So you can have multi, multiple users on each GPU um, and a lot of bandwidth. So. Uh, again, this harkens back to the PCI Express generation three versus generation four. The new GPUs are generation four, which has twice the bandwidth of the older generation three GPUs. And then NVLink is NVIDIA's proprietary link between GPUs, which again is, is also had a two X increase in bandwidth with this generation. So you can now push on paper 32 gigabytes a second over PCI Express. Um, from our testing so far, you get probably 25, 26 gigabytes per second in practice, but still, uh, 25, 25 gigabytes per second out of a single device is, is kind of impressive to see. Um, on the fabric side of things, that usually ties in with, um, with HDR InfiniBand or 200 gig ethernet. And again, on, on those 200 gig interfaces, we're seeing about 25 gigabytes per second. So uh, I, I'm impressed anyway. Uh, 
And then digging into the tensor core a little, a little bit. So again, this is a, this is a special hardware unit designed for matrix multiplies. And it now supports a lot of different uh, instruction types. So FP64, which is double precision, usually what's used in HPC. This is the first time that, that NVIDIA has supported anything like that. And then they have uh, TF32, which I'll, I'll describe, uh, BF16, which is the B float. So, so that's, uh, I guess, an instruction that was first desired by Google for their deep learning. Um, Intel has some support for it. Now NVIDIA has some support for it. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you exactly what that looks like. And then um, you can also do these matrix multiplies on even, uh, you know, like on integers, 8-bit eight, eight integers, 4-bit integers, and even binary units, which um, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen how that's being used, but um, there might be some interesting applications of that. Um, one important thing to note if, if you're um, an NVIDIA user is that on this new architecture, they're defaulting to this new TF32 instruction. Uh, NVIDIA says that they ran all the models they could on it in their internal systems and uh, they weren't seeing any uh, accuracy losses. And so they, they went ahead and made it the default. So that is a change um, that, that may be important for some people to be aware of. Um, and uh, the sparse matrices support, which I mentioned before, allows them to get some interesting performance improvements. Um, so this is how the tensor core operates. And um, in the previous generation with NVIDIA V100, um, they were using a full 32-bit instruction. And in the new A100 GPU, they're using a uh, what looks a little bit like a 32-bit instruction called TF32. Um, and, and here's what's going on. So this would be a full 32-bit FP32 uh, floating point number, right? There's, a, there's a, a sign for positive or negative, and then you have uh, eight bits for, I'm gonna get these reversed. Um, you, have, you have eight bits of range and then 23 bits of precision. Um, and what TensorFlow 32 does is it, it combines, uh, the, the accuracy of a 16-bit number with the range of a 32-bit number. Um, so you don't have very much precision, but you have just as much range as if you were using a full 32-bit instruction. Um, and I know this kind of gets really esoteric. Um, it is starting to, to come into use in HPC. So um, for those developing software applications, it's worth starting to think about some of these problems. I'm working with a group that is, um, that is implementing a CFD code with TensorFlow. And it, it's really interesting to see how that's, that's working. Um, you could do some, some very interesting things. Um, and down at the bottom, you'll see Bfloat 16, which again, I think Google was the, was the main driver of that originally. Um, so Bfloat 16 had the same range as a 32-bit number, but considerably less precision. And NVIDIA is kind of mixed, they're kind of in the middle now with, um, with better precision than a B float, uh, but um, sorry, better, better precision than a B float, uh, but a lot fewer bits than a 32-bit. Uh, thanks, John, for, for correcting me. It's the, the sign, the uh, mantissa, and the exponent. Uh, and then uh, again, same kind of tensor core unit, but with 64-bit instructions. Um, and this is what may be particularly of interest to HPC users. On paper, you can get a 2.5x 2, 2 speed up if you can fully leverage the tensor core unit on an HPC application. Um, there's no funny games with, with precision or, or accuracy here. Um, it, is a, it is a full 64-bit instruction that's going into that, that matrix unit. Um, Here's what they're seeing today. Um, and these are NVIDIA's own numbers published on their website, right? So they're, they're showing for some of the common apps you may have heard of, a um, little shy of 2x performance in honesty, right? Um, but we have seen that, um, that as applicant, for any architecture, as applications get optimized, that those numbers tighten up and they start being able to, to fully leverage the hardware. So that'll probably get better over time um, as it would with any architecture. The other interesting bit with this new GPU is the, uh, is the capability called MIG, which lets them split up a, a single GPU into seven slices. Um, and, and in some ways you might think of this 
as the first um, the first real kind of virtualization ish capability in a GPU um, because previous GPUs you could kind of share them in certain ways between processes there were there was less isolation between users and whatnot um, but this looks like the first generation where you can really be sure that there's some 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 actual hardware isolation between yourself and other users on the GPU um, so it's it's more secure it's more fault tolerant and it's just you know for an HPC center um, that is able to, that has a lot of users that might not need a full GPU you can do some interesting things right a lot of people are using Jupyter notebooks these days where they might need access to a GPU but they don't necessarily need access sole access to a ten thousand dollar GPU all the time and they can do some development work on a, a slice of a GPU it's going to be pretty interesting to see uh, what what's possible with that I think and um, it isn't just a seven way slice. If you want, you can, you can take, you know, a half of the GPU or a quarter of the GPU and you can kind of mix and match these. So you could have a couple of two slices along with several single slices. Um, right now, uh, they're mostly focused on Kubernetes for this. So Kubernetes is gonna be the first one out of the gate that supports this kind of mixing and matching of, of GPUs. Um, but Slurm isn't too far behind. So later this year, you'll be able to, you know, to log into a Slurm GPU cluster and say, I want one seventh of a GPU or two sevenths of a GPU or whatever. And it'll, it'll schedule your job and you'll be good to go. So that'll, that'll be interesting, I think. Um, I've seen it in use in EDU where they'll be running a lab and uh, you know every student needs access to a GPU in the lab. They start up a Jupyter Net, uh, Jupyter Notebook. Any student can kind of do development work on a, a slice of a GPU. And then uh, another bit of news that dropped was NVIDIA's HPC SDK, which in some ways is a is a renaming of previous tools. So if you know the name PGI Portland Group Compilers, those have been kind of fully and officially folded into NVIDIA now. NVIDIA acquired them a, a few years ago. Um, so the old, uh, what is it, PG, C++, and all those, um, all those compiler tools. Uh, are now folded into NVIDIA's tools. And you can see here the various libraries they have. They have, they have quite a few um, pr pretty capable math libraries. And then they've got uh, debuggers and profilers, and uh, they've got a new roofline analysis tool. Um, so if you're using a GPU, you owe it to yourself to look at this if you're developing for NVIDIA GPUs, because there's a lot of tools. And I think some people um, probably don't avail themselves of the tools as much as they could there. These tools are uh, free as in beer, so to speak. Um, so you can download them for free, but they're not open source. And then if you're actually looking at, at what hardware is available, um, there are single GPU cards, there are uh, four-way linked GPUs and eight-way linked GPUs. Um, so the, the, if, if you are scaling up a job where there needs to be a lot of communication between processes, you want the, the four way or eight way linked GPUs because they have, um, uh, bandwidth between all of the various GPUs. If you go with the card style GPUs, you can only have them in pairs, which means you can't get your, uh, can't get full communication between all four or all eight GPUs. And that NV link speed again was doubled in this generation. So you're now talking about 300 gigabytes per second um, coming out of out of each GPU. So it's it's uh, ex extraordinarily impressive bandwidths that are that are going between these GPUs. Um, and Nvidia then has their own server platform, which is kind of an all-in-one appliance system. And uh, <clears throat> this is an eight GPU system. So it's got the, the 300 gigabytes per second between each, each GPU, each of the eight GPUs. And then it's got, as you'll kind of see in the back, there's, uh, there's 10 network adapters. Each network adapter is a uh, 200 gig network adapter. So there's a crazy amount of bandwidth coming out of these things. And, uh, and NVIDIA built themselves a, a large size cluster. <laughs> and uh, currently that cluster is number seven on the top 500 and number two on the green 500. So it's very power efficient. Um, and, and very capable overall. So they, they took 140 of their, their eight GPU systems and, and built them together into this cluster, as well as some uh, uh, 200 gig InfiniBand and uh, DDN storage. Um, DDN has been partnering with NVIDIA on some uh, RDMA storage capabilities. So you can, you can feed data 
straight from a storage device into a GPU without touching the CPU, which is uh, again, up and coming and, and kind of interesting. And uh, breakdown for those of you who are interested in the comparisons. Uh, the last time I showed this, Radeon fared a bit better and I'm sure AMD will be showing something new in the not too distant future. And that'll, that'll be interesting to see that comparison. But right now, Nvidia's A100 is looking pretty solid, uh, winning kind of a, across the board, so to speak. And again, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share this presentation so you don't have to, to dig through everything here. Um, there's a lot of squiggly lines in this because all of these capabilities re really depend, <coughs> depend on your application. Well, sorry about that. So depending on your application, you're going to anywhere from 10 teraflops to 20 teraflops. And uh, it's, we're going to have to see how these things nail down over time. Um, okay. And then another interesting thing, um, this one is not is not available yet, right? We've had people asking and, and uh, we're gonna have to wait a bit longer to see it. Um, probably by the end of the year, hopefully we'll see it, but it's um, some of the first merging of NVIDIA and Mellanox technology. So they've taken this new GPU, stuck it on a network card and um, they think it's gonna be most useful at the edge. It'll be interesting to find out. Uh, I, I think people are gonna probably do some interesting things with it. Um, so the, the exact GPU compute capability isn't uh, isn't quite clear yet. Um, it's a but a dual hundred gig E or dual hundred gig InfiniBand links on this card with a GPU, with um, with a secure en enclave and uh, encryption. And the, and the idea with that is you can you can deploy your application somewhere on the edge, um, and if someone you know steals it and runs away with the box, um, your your software is encrypted. And uh, you know, as soon as the box loses power, those keys are lost, and um, you know they've got your hardware, but they don't have your software or whatever data was on the box. So could could be interesting. Um, and there are developer kits. So I know I know we have some some fans of the Jetson in previous generations. There's a new one. Uh, I think it just launched last month, uh, 400 bucks. So it's you know pricey as far as the developer kit goes, but but capable. Um, so it's got uh, a voltage generation GPU on it, an ARM, six core ARM, eight gigs of memory. You know, it's got wired ethernet capability, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, and you can configure it for different power consumption. So it goes as low as 10 watts. <clears throat> um, and there are other form factors of this available. Um, a lot of times people will build on this box and then um, go to an even more embedded version as, as they're you know scaling up, so to speak. Uh, and I've got homework here too, and I'll, so I'll share these slides. Um, there's there's a lot, a lot you can dig from. Okay. So uh, we've got a few minutes left, I think. Um, I'm curious if anyone wants to bring anything up. I've I've got a few a few HPC uh, discussion topics if uh, no one has anything specific that they want to bring up themselves. So the floor is open. All right, so um, this is a question is a lot a question of people lot have been people asking themselves. Asking. I'm, I'm, curious yeah, I'm curious if anyone has, anyone strong, has strong, strong opinions. Strong. Or what did I miss? Kurt, did I miss any, any uh, important up and comers here? No, not yet. Um, I got, I got, I, I've got a little bit of a risk five announcement, but they're um, they're a long ways away from having anything in the HPC space. I, I, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I guess there's just, just just a lot of momentum behind the 
the traditional options. I mean, I, I see quite a bit in my small, my small sliver of the world that um, people just kind of go with what works and don't always, well, I mean, it's, it's, it can be extra work to, to go outside of the, the norm too far. So I, I guess I understand that. Um, so we're we'll in the Neocortex uh, presentation today. So I, I've got a little yeah. bit of a breakdown of the, of what Neocortex is doing. Uh, so I'll give that at the, at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, yeah, what I see um, is, is pretty much x86, right? We, we see a little bit of uh, power uh, and a request every once in a while for a couple of arm boxes. Um, but, but, you know, it's been Xeon mostly for the last couple of years. Oops. And, um, and Epic is now, is now starting to, uh, to be of interest to some. Um, although maybe, maybe not as many as you would think. Um, Epic has some, some really impressive performance numbers, but even so, um, you know, some people are just really comfortable with Intel and uh, it might take, take some, um, sometimes it takes a while for people to, to adopt something new. So it'd be interesting to watch as that continues. I know some of the US centers, certainly in Europe, ARM is, is starting to, to, to take a bite. Um, and obviously in Japan, ARM is taking a bite, so to speak, since, um, since their number one supercomputer is using the Fujitsu ARM. Um, and then same on, the, uh, same on the accelerator side, right? We're starting to see a lot of options. Um, some, of the, some of the Intel products are, are up and coming. Um, but have already uh, seen some wins in the U.S. Um, so, for example, Argon is going to be taking a, a big system that has the, the Intel GPU. I guess Mike 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 was cutting his own hair too, and then Mike finally went to the barber. Mike's hair, Mike's hair looked really good with him Someone's trimming got an open it. Mic. He, he would do the he would use that electronic thing. My mute, electronic my mute thing? powers are not working. <laughs> Floby? Huh? Floby? I don't know what you're talking about. He would, he would cut his own hair. He's in, Any I'm feedback from the crowd on uh, accelerators? And then, um, and then he he would like make his top. Do you know about any other accelerators? Um, something outside of the GPU epistemology? Is there something that does, um, I don't know, crypto on a on a PCI card edge? Crypto on a PCI card. Um, yeah, you would think there would be something. I, I, I don't know. Um, I am sometimes a bit of a distance away from some of the, the non-traditional HPC. Um, oh, so Josh is saying QAT. Yeah, so I don't know how many people know about that. Is that a function built into a CPU or is that a separate device? It's an accelerator, it's a separate device. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's for crypto and encryption. I'm just trying to find the link for that, hold on. Okay, great, thanks. Um, Kurt, I think most of the other accelerators that I've seen are, are a play on an FPGA. Um, I know. Yeah. Tech, was it Texas Instruments that made a play with something? But I never heard where it got adopted, if anywhere. I think there was some talk about being able to buy a, a discrete TPU card from Google. Oh, from Google. <laughs> that didn't happen though, right? No, no. <laughs> they gotta, they gotta you know, keep you paying monthly for your TPUs. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and another thing is, and I can't answer this uh, because code play is into specialized accelerators and Codeplay is the one who's going to do the next workshop that I posted the link to on DPC++ NVIDIA uh, compiler. So, you know, if, if anyone is interested uh, in that, you can attend and Codeplay will be there. You can ask that question or otherwise also, if someone is interested, I'll be happy to connect you with them. Thank you. And, um, and yeah, most of you folks on the line here are, I think, are, are members in the HPC meetup group. That's probably the easiest way to, to find people. If you need to, you can send messages to other people in the group. Or even you can chat here, I think, inside Zoom. Um, okay. Well, I'm almost out of time, but uh, 
this this might be the the biggest religious war of them all about uh how you're going to write your code and i'm sure i missed some here um but this is usually these are usually what i see come up in discussion one of these languages on uh, some of the more traditional hpc systems and, yeah uh, yeah so open open HTC, you know that nvidia is really agnostic now between CUDA and open ACC, as far as I can tell, it's like, you know, tell us what functionality you want, come to one of our hackathons and, and we'll find a, a language for you. So, so open ACC seems to be in growing in popularity at MIT. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Cause it almost seems in some way there's a, there's a push away from that towards some of these, um, I don't just want to call them, um, more specialty languages like Sickle and, and and Nvidia has their own version now that they released with CUDA 11, where it's just C. Uh, it's a it's a new version of C plus plus that supports parallel um, operations. I honestly don't don't know it that well. Um, but I but I hear less about OpenACC than I used to. Um, and for quite a few bit of these accelerators, you can use OpenMP as well. Um, Yeah, so uh, for those who are interested, DPC++ is, uh, is built on top of C++ and SQL, and that would run on uh, NVIDIA hardware. So, Jato, you think that the, the, the DC, so DCP++, is that going to be the most common language used for, for uh, one API? Yeah, one API is based on DPC++. Yeah. Plus plus. yeah. yeah. Okay. So we see a lot of adoption. Uh, I, as I mentioned of FPGA, a lot of people are converting OpenCL code to SQL and DPC++ plus plus, uh, right now. And there are developers who are uh, also porting CUDA code to DPC++ plus plus because they want to become vendor neutral. Mm -hmm. And so when you do that, you should be able to target an Intel CPU or uh -huh. an NVIDIA GPU or an FPGA or. Yeah. Or and Intel know. GPUs when they come. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. But in the meantime, NVIDIA GPU. And since Sickle works on AMD, so it will work on AMD as well. Cool. Uh, well, I used up all my time, I think. And that's all I had to share. So I'll, I'll post my slides. I know I had a lot of links. Definitely go watch, like almost all those YouTube, those videos are on YouTube um, for, for ISC. So they're pretty easy to find, but there's there's a lot of cool stuff you can uh, you can dig into. Yeah, this was great, Elliot. It, it was a great summary of the event for those of us who did not go there. Good, thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, and you didn't miss it because it's all on YouTube. So just, you know, this weekend, just hang out on the couch <laughs> and watch 140 videos. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Kurt. I think you're going to send me a link, Kurt. Is that what you want to do? Yes. Um, I just oh, put it in the yep. window. Um, the reason I'm doing this is I have, for some reason, ungodly bandwidth problems right now. And and indeed, Elliot, if I do if I do fall off the air here, just carry on. Alrighty. <laughs> in spirit if not in voice yeah um, okay um the good thing about all those links is um, the, the first chunk of the link i'm talking about is autonomous vehicles and that's kind of what me and the undergraduates have been doing for a little while um in the absence of of uh of other things um uh there's a, an increasingly tight association between autonomous vehicles Linux, uh, NVIDIA Jetson, and I'm, I'll, I'll walk through some of the things we've been doing lately to, uh, to try to show you what we're doing and what at least um, by my count, two dozen other universities across the US are doing. Uh, my first link there is the, is the uh, Indianapolis Autonomous Challenge. Now, now we've been involved, the BU students, uh, a couple of MIT students, myself, have been involved with um, uh, autonomous vehicle competitions of some variety over the course of the years. 
um, the IGDC James to mine, the International Ground Vehicle Vehicle Contest. Those aren't really the typical classes there. They only recently opened up one called the Self Drive Division. Now those are vehicles that you might recognize. Uh, for a while there, they were they were these Polaris Gem golf cart style things. So so certainly certainly battery powered like EVs, um, and then progressively more and more with some Linux box on there retrofitted in to uh, to bypass all the all the electronics and and go straight to the automotives. Um, so that got canceled this year. I uh, don't think they plan on bringing back the 2020 competition. I think they'll just wait till 2021. A lot of those competitions have fallen by the wayside, but the BU students and I got in on one of the joint teams at the uh, at the Indy Autonomous Challenge. We're on team Pegasus. There's another MIT team listed, um, but I'm not quite sure what their involvement will be. I've, I've read on their website that that they've got, they've got other um, interests. They compete in this thing called um uh the the student i think it's called um um it, it, it's a it's a student competition that's very heavily european schools and mit partners with tu delft um florida student formula student that's it and uh they may be spending more time with that and will not be able to participate in the in the autonomous challenge um and that decision may be driven yeah there we are there's team pegasus i don't know if uh the the only thing they really have for links there are links to people's white papers which was our first deliverable and now our next deliverable we, we've had one since then but our next deliverable will be in in august and that will be a demonstration of a functional functional vehicle so you can see the difficulty with working on an autonomous vehicle competition when you don't have access to a garage or um the uh the the other teammates so we're we're doing we're doing as best as we can we have we have weekly meetings and um uh in accordance with the rules of the competition we're we're using their recommended packages which is a ROS 2 so robot operating system is what everyone wants to use in the linux based av business they're using a ROS 2 uh form um which we're we're learning some of the the peculiarities of uh, it's very easy it's very easy to get get smart on raws which is a superset that sits on top of your linux and it's uh, very much of a publish and subscribe model like you'll spin up a um a driver for your lidar and you'll publish that information and some of your other uh demons can read that information while it's being published so so that's a so it's very easy to get smart on raws quickly and we're we're getting smart on ROS too, there are some peculiarities with the, the new generation ROS. There's also an iROS, industrial ROS, which which um, a lot of the uh, oh, defense contractors like to use. It's, it's a little bit more secure, discrete. The packages uh, uh, are separated a little bit better. Uh, so I don't know much about iROS, uh, but I am getting smart on ROS too. Now, in parallel to this, because we're big fans of, of Sticking with the code bases we've already worked with, we were participating in this Project Aslan. So Project Aslan is an, is an open source, uh, open science uh, uh, way to get your your code out there. It, one of the founding partners of this was was a group that we've been working with a lot in Oxford in the UK, that uh, Street Drone. So Street Drone had an open street Street Drone source, which it, you know, quite conveniently for us, worked great on the Jetson, on the NVIDIA Jetson. NVIDIA Jetson, is, as Elliot said, kind of parallels the NVIDIA discrete card product line. It's, uh, it's, uh, it stays about a year behind, but, but usually keeps up. As you, as you saw, they have a, a, um, a Jetson now that has Volta cores on it. Not as many, and most importantly, um, m tuned to uh, low power. So that that Jetson um, runs off of USB. I, I, th I think the Volta Jetson runs off of USB, or maybe that's the last generation. So, so it's perfect for us if we're building a drone or an autonomous vehicle of some variety, some little credit card size processor sock or or board that sits on top 
of of uh, your your automation interface. That worked great for us. Turns out a lot of other people are interested in that. Certainly in the the very specific specific vertical of autonomous research in universities, having a Jetson based um, electric vehicle is uh, becoming quite popular. Um, there is a there's a a company that's being funded by Renault. Renault makes the Twizy, which is pretty popular in the in the UK. They also make a number of other vehicles that look like the Twizy. The Twizy looks a little bit like a um, uh, like a, a Mercedes smart car. It's about that same form factor. Uh, you may have seen some in the city of Cambridge. There's a there's a company that has uh, Twizies. It, it's basically the blue bike of, of vehicles. You can park it anywhere and in Cambridge and then just, um, um, you know, it's kind of a combination between uh, uh, the, the cars that you can, like the Turo car, you can leave a street anywhere and then you just wave your super heterodyne chip over the front windshield and get into it. Uh, hasn't quite caught on yet anywhere else in the US, I guess it's up San Francisco because the Twizy, the Twizy is, is not only not great for the US, but it's um, uh, certainly, been discontinued. Renault um, has has the Palm now, which is where they partnered with a company called OS Vehicles. So this so this will be the duct tape of the people who want an autonomous vehicle for research and development. Whether it sees any time on the streets of Massachusetts, I don't know. We're we're pretty well set up for it. The uh, city of Boston has an autonomous zone, and they've they've published that report there on. On uh, on where you can drive your autonomous vehicle in Boston, as you might as you might expect, uh, it's over near Mass Robotics and um, Autonomous Ride and and Waymo and those other companies that are over there in the Innovation District. Um, and the city of Cambridge is zoning a whole section, potentially the whole city, for 20 miles per hour, and that'll be great for electric vehicles and, and autonomous electric vehicles. Uh, where the sweet spot is between having a fleet of EVs <coughs> or AVs um, to either deliver people or, or uh, you know, Amazon boxes, I'm not sure. There's been plenty of false starts. Uh, I'm hoping this Project Aslan, because it's also targeted at a 20 mile per hour maximum speed, may have a little bit more traction. So I'll keep it posted on that. Uh, I'm really quite fascinated how how quickly the code bases for Jetson-based uh, Roz, Roz slash Jetson slash um, Renault interface has has really taken off. Um, so then I listed a couple of the um, uh, AUV New England conferences. We have um, AUV SI New England has. Uh, you can probably scroll down to uh, where is that one? The the AUV SI New England org has the Robotica conference. Yeah, the last one on the AV topics. No, there you go. Um, they have the Robotica Conference. Now, the Robotica Conference used to be here every year at Draper, but but what they're doing now is they're breaking up the presentations across, um, you know, the next couple of months. They had one last month. This guy up at University of Waterloo, Darwin AI, um, he he presented his topics, and I think that's what they'll start doing from now on. Is having these these lectures spread out over over the the course of a number of months on this website. Now the good news is, uh, you know, Robotica you used to have to pay and and block out um, a weeknight to go to, and now it's it's free online for all comers. You just register, and uh, and you, then you get to it'll be smaller attendees. You get to interact with the speaker that way, which works out a little bit better, I think, for the for the speakers. Um, the other section I have on the AV topics is is a link to the um, MIT Industrial Liaison Program conference. Um, it's right that little block there that says ilp.mit.edu under AUVSI conference. So so the first day of the ILP conference, um, we had um, uh, Professor Caramon from from the Flight Goggles Lab talk talk. That was the that was the first day. There's a lot of good stuff at the autonomy conference. But I was really impressed with that that first day. <clears throat> Professor Caramon talked about his chip. So he has a chip that he puts onto his drone boards, and his drone board can also fit as a daughter board on top of a 
uh, uh, Jetson, and he talked a little bit about how they're using his flight goggle software to compete in the in the Lockheed Alpha Pilot competition. Now, uh, it was supposed to they were going to do a semis and a finals, and that was supposed to sum up here um, this month or maybe next, but they've postponed it. Uh, so, so they'll probably have the Alpha Pilot competition 2021, and maybe they'll be back on the same schedule that they were on for 2020, not just not just delaying 2020 for six months, but being back on a 2021 schedule. So so I'll keep you posted on that. Last time I went to the Alpha Pilot site, it said it had been postponed, but now it's now it's definitely canceled for 2020. And uh, but you can meanwhile, I can go to the flight goggles.mit site and download the SDK and and work on uh, the navigation tools. So so he's hoping that that the virtual navigation and the remote vehicle will work in lockstep so that the the delay will not significantly change um the uh the performance uh i i think what that means is if you've got a course and you're going to need no less than five second um uh timing between your joystick and what the remote vehicle does at that course, then they'll design the course so that you can pivot um, in five seconds and, and then uh, at least not get into an accident. They'll be, uh, it's, it's not clear to me how they'll, they'll stagger that off, but, but, I'll, um, but I'll certainly know more on Alpha Pilot before they open that back up in 2021. Um, and then I just wanted to talk about some of the other upcoming conferences that, uh, that Elliot didn't hit uh, the the big flagship IEEE conference at MIT is high performance embedded computing. It's now actually high performance extreme computing because of the overlap now on the various topics that that are um, that are hitting us. A lot of people have changed the focus of their HPC conference now to incorporate HPC and AI to to capture a lot of the discussions that are going on with the low precision tools. Uh, hybrid tools, you know, a lot of people want to use the machine they bought for native double precision math to, to do some of these other um, uh, applications, TensorFlow, BERT, uh, you know, they, they want to be able to, to use their, their double precision gear for, for multiple activities and AI uh, performs much faster at lower precision or with iterative refinement or some of these other tools. So, uh, so a lot of conferences like HPEC and uh, what used to be called HPC on Wall Street is now called HPC and AI on Wall Street. They will incorporate some of this new hardware into, yeah, so they, 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 still, they still have the March announcement here. Um, I have to figure, since this is in New York City, that, that the September event in New York City, HPC and AI on Wall Street will be delayed but the reason they haven't taken that that announcement down yet is because it's actually starting to look like uh there might be a lot going on in new york city in september i'm not sure massachusetts will move as fast as as new york but they may go ahead with this conference in some limited um some limited uh, attendance perspective but with uh with with also with a remote uh back end this is a pretty good conference to go to. You'll, you'll see a lot of a lot of codes there, a lot of vendors there that that you don't see at, at supercomputing and and uh, some of the other HPC conferences. Um, it's uh, gotten much bigger. Um, Tabor, uh, which owns HPC Wire and some of the other news outlets, has taken over this conference now. So they've moved it to a, a bigger hotel. They'll uh, they'll probably broaden some of the areas. It's a uh, nominally uh i believe right now a day and a half conference and so maybe they'll extend the the format there too uh, um i i wanted to tell folks possibly uh folks that go to isc a lot that there is another european conference pask pasc is postponed but i went to psc 19 it's the week after isc and they they kind of want people to come down to Switzerland out of Frankfurt. There's like a day between ISC and PASC. And it's a lot of the same um, presentations, uh, 
the national labs from the US have a lot of presentations there. So there's a lot of content. Anything you couldn't see at ISC, they have at PASC. Um, I also have listed there another couple of the automotive con conferences. I think I'll get with some of the students online and ask them if uh, they want to attend. These are all virtual now. They they've been they were listed originally as um, as attendee, but like the uh, automated vehicle symposium, that's one hundred and fifty nine dollars for a student. So so I will definitely pay for a student to attend that if they're interested in. It's uh, about a two day <coughs> it's a two day um, remote conference, mostly topics. There seems to be a lot of overlap on on certain subject areas. Like you'll get you'll get five lectures on on what level of automation we should allow on the streets of uh, the United States. Should we actually allow a human to jump in at level four and, and take over the automation in a stressful situation? That's a that's a big topic right now. If your if your automation starts choking on you, is it really a good thing for the for the guy in the in the back seats that's been reading the New York Times to jump in and take over driving at that point? Um, and then down there at the bottom, I, I do have a couple of uh, miscellaneous links. I, I'm on a couple of lists that, that are constantly out um, uh, job listings. And uh, the national labs are hiring like crazy right now for people with AI and, and computer architecture and HPC and um, uh, in design chops. And they're not really being too picky about you having to move to California or to New Mexico. The verbiage implies that, you know, they say location, Berkeley, California, but um, but they're um, being pretty negotiable on some of these, apparently. Those are what I'm, I'm getting in my email. So, so if you see something there that has your name on it, uh, there's a lot of quantum computing going on on the left coast. There's a, there's a ton of computer architecture. If you know anything about some of these higher level chip design languages, like, you know, um, uh, blue spec or chisel or, or scale out you they they have positions for that and I can certainly see how to do that remotely um, the only other links I, I can probably tell you about down there um, radio free HPC has has a discussion with the the direction that risk 5 is going in the HP space now that was going to be a big presentation at ISC where they've they've got a new task force, a new working group that's that's looking at HPC. I think they may have missed their window. Arm has jumped into HPC as as Elliot told you with with both feet. Uh, I sat in on this that CMU uh, the uh, Pittsburgh supercomputing link there is to the neocortex lecture, which was earlier today. Uh, they're going to post that online. The not just the uh, uh, the presentation, but a lot of the links. Neocortex is built out of these interesting cerebrus, um, they call them processors, but they look more like a sheet of paper. They're so big. They, uh, they use, um, I, I ha kind of had to catch my breath when he said, yeah, our processors use two kilowatts each. <laughs> and he's got two of them. Uh, so, so these cerebrus, uh, for those of you that, that saw that $1 million doorstop they had at, at SC19 in Denver. I'm really impressed at how quickly they've moved with that, and and they're going to give people um, academics uh, early access to uh, the Cerebrus CS1-based uh, supercomputer. It's also got a um, uh, well, like I say, it, as soon as they post the presentation, it'll answer all of your questions. It's got 18 gigs of SRAM. Uh, everything, every trace is silicon. It's, a, it's a really a remarkable design. I think that's the natural progression of where things may end up in the HPC business. If we can consolidate everything onto one big piece of silicon, move all of our discrete chipsets off of the motherboard and introduce it as an IP block into the, into the silicon and, and I don't know, 65 nanometer. Well, no, it'd have to be less than that. It'd have to be some contemporary fab process, but just a lot of layers. And either two plus one D or maybe they'll finally have three D down by that. You can you can certainly do that with, with uh, HMC or um, you know hybrid memory cubes, some of these new technologies. It looks like all of the building blocks are there. And Cerebrus might have nailed it. That'll be 
really interesting to see if if this is uh, the way of the future. And we'll find out by running our TensorFlow and our PyTorch codes on on the Neocortex cluster. So those are those are kind of all of my links. I can certainly speak on you know if you want to catch me offline, I can certainly speak on some of those individually. I wanted to leave a lot of time for the BU students because uh, they've been uh, they've been fastidiously working on Sundays since. Uh, you know the end of the semester, so they they uh, they can probably bring us up to speed on a on a couple of couple of their topics. But uh, but if you want, I'll I'll answer a few questions right now. Well, if no one else speaks, Kurt, um, I'm curious um, for the Cerebras systems. Um, I mean, they're they're big HPC, right? That's like you gotta you gotta drop a million dollars or more to get one, right? It's not for the masses yet but you think maybe it will be for the masses at some point? Yeah, and it, I, I wasn't quite sure on the architecture. I, I Maybe I missed that slide. They were very, very chatty about certain aspects of it, and they certainly didn't imply that there was any NDAs. But I, but I think they're using uh, maybe a lot of integer, certainly a lot of single precision. I don't know if they've got the same some of the same uh, floating point definitions that that you described that Nvidia uses. I, so I'm not mm -hmm. sure about that yet, um, but uh, but I'll grab that. That was that was early in. Um, uh, they they had the architecture guys speak second, uh, so I'll I'll check that um, when the slides come out. Thanks. I'll uh, I'll second your recommendation for radio free HPC too. That's a pretty. Those guys are pretty interesting to listen to. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else have questions for Kurt? Comments? Turn it over to the students. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Natalia, are you are you taking this one? Do you have a screen to share, or do you want me to pull up your slides? Uh, actually, I'll be taking. Oh, over. okay. Yeah. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, I'll stop mine. Uh, all right. So, hey, everyone. Um, Hold on, Ben. We got you muted accidentally. See if you can unmute yourself. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, right. So, um, I'm Ben and you, John Norman, are also here. So we're going to be presenting about a competition that we're planning to attend in the fall. Um, Natasha and Quentin, they're also here, recently graduated from BU and they used to be our club leaders. Now it is us. So <clears throat> um, in the past, we've been to and presented at a couple of these meetings before, uh, but for this year, we're hoping to make a regular appearance. Um, so during the school year, we have meetings, uh, weekly meetings face to face. But now due to COVID, we're not sure uh, what exactly is going to happen. Um, BU, um, like many other colleges, are kind of planning a choose your own adventure for, for the fall semester. Um, so that's classes with like a hybrid approach, um, rotating between in-person but socially distanced learning uh, as well as remote learning. Um, and uh, especially clubs will have limited meeting times and seating capacity. So what that means for us is we need to figure out whether or not our club can operate remotely. Um, planning for SC20, uh, yes, we can do it remotely. We have been doing that. Club meetings, we've also been doing that remotely. Our Raspberry, our Raspberry Pi cluster that we're still building, um, it'll be a challenge, but we can still do most of that remotely um, through SSHing uh, in, into the cluster. Um, so I guess really being remote uh, allows us more flexibility and possibly higher attendance um, at club meetings since there's no need to actually uh, get yourself out of bed every Sunday morning. So the main thing that we'd like to talk about is um, SC20, uh, one of the supercomputing competitions that we're planning on attending later in the year. Uh, so SC20 is an HPC conference that lasts for the better part of the week. Um, this year it's being held in Atlanta. And as part of the conference each year, um, 
a student cluster competition is held during the conference. And this is the competition that we try to get into every single year. Um, lately, we haven't been having much luck, but hopefully because of the changes made to the competition for this year, uh, we'll be able to squeeze in. So the competition will be, be held remotely, um, but uh, people who are uh, teams who are admitted are still allowed to attend in person, which will be a club decision. Um, and there's no more choosing hardware. Instead, we're given our zero credits and we have to pick our software stack. So actually, Elliot, to answer one of your discussion points from earlier, um, initially when we were first uh, writing out our proposal for the competition, we were going to go with um, AMD Epic. So our next system, uh, we we're going to choose that. We also took a look at the IBM Power as well as an offering from uh, Oracle. But we, we decided on the Epic because um, good price to performance um, as well as uh, pretty good AVX support, which, which would help us a lot for a lot of the um, parallel uh, applications. So the application- Are you gonna be able to select Epic CPUs from the Azure? Uh, do you get to pick that's your-, your... what we're not sure about. Um, the way the prompts were uh, reworded, it sounds like they choose the system for you and ah, it's all okay. about the software. Um, but as I said, we're really not sure. Um, yeah, so application decisions come out in about two days. Um, so fingers crossed, hopefully we get in. Uh, so the competition has seven total parameters, um, but we've prepared three of them that we'd like to talk about today. So I guess we can start off with Norman. So for this application, the high performance conjugate gradient, it's a significant departure from the classic uh, LINPACK benchmark, um, since it uses more sparse data structures that have a very low compute to data movement radi ratio. And so it, this one uses sparse matrix vector multiplication, vector updates, global doc products, and local symmetric um, basically a lot of math equations thrown at the processor to be able to see um, how good it's working. And, and then a valid run needs to execute a large enough problem so that those data arrays access in that CG iteration loop don't fit in the cache so that it would be unrealistic in a reapplication setting, but it would allow to show the best possible um, benchmark itself. And then this restriction only means that the problem size should be large enough to occupy a significant fraction of main memory at least one fourth of that um, space. And then they say that HPCG is um, gonna be like the future in terms of what um, benchmarks could be used for HPC and could be even better than LIMPAC in the future. Okay, yeah, so that was um, the first of the applications, I believe. And then Yuja will be telling us about the biological applications. Um, hey everyone, I'm new to HPC, but um, I am uh, here to uh, tell you more about the biological applications of HPC. So for SC20, we have uh, GrowMax. Uh, so GrowMax is a versatile package for performing molecular dynamics. For, so um, even if you don't know much about molecular biology, so basically we have um, many different kinds of particles um, and those that are most relevant to um, human or proteins, lipids, nuclear acids. And of course they have um, complicated bonded interactions between each other. So it is important to um, model them using uh, Newtonian equations. So again, a lot of um, math equations involved and um, which requires a lot of computational power. Um, Gromax can also be used for um, non-biological systems such as polymers. I also did a little bit more research on how HPC could be um, used because that is there is definitely more that um, HPC could do. Um, so the first thing I I looked up is cancer treatment. So we all know that um, um, bioinformatics today is a big thing and. Of course, you need ground truth for that. So how are you gonna get all the ground truth? You have to get uh, accurate genomic data, which requires genome sequencing. Um, so for now, uh, the most reliable technology is the next generation sequencing, which 
requires paralyzing uh, many micro scale reactions at the same time. So that is definitely one place where parallel computing come into comes into play. Um, so I, I guess this is more biology because I'm a biomedical engineering major, but uh, um, this kind of sequencing can output like 15,000 times as much as as much data per day as a traditional sequencing technology. Um, we also need the uh, HPC for storing terabytes of information that we collected from different genomes. Um, and personally, I, I'm, well, yeah, I'm interested in HPC because it has a huge implication in biological tissue simulation. Um, just imagine you want to study uh, a piece of biological tissue and the only thing you can model on the computer is to um, develop either a center-based model or a lattice model. So let's take a lattice model as an example. Um, so imagine a 3D space, which is divided into different grids. And um, the, a typical problem we want to tackle it, tackle with is how, uh, like for a single cell in that grid, do you have any neighbors? And you want to perform search, that's searching. And we know searching is a huge problem in algorithm development. So um, right now there's a project called uh, Biodynamic Model Project. So this is a platform for um, biological tissue simulation. And it is really, HPC is really relevant in this context because um, in order to simulate the neuron activity, um, and we know that neuron fires, all the neurons fire at the same time. Um, that is uh, where parallel computing must uh, come into play. Um, also, we mentioned that we want to search for the neighbors of individual cells, and that requires um, huge computational power for the um, for data structures like spatial trees. Um, because when you want to detect your neighbor and uh, even insert a new cell into your system, um, searching and insertion, uh, at most we can uh, uh, maximize, or I mean like um, at most the best computational complexity is n squared or even n log n, but um, because you have so many uh, cells in a grid, and also um, if you want to use a uh, more complex data structure like oct tree, oct trees or R tree, um, which is not just binary tree, um, you would definitely need um, HPC to uh, speed up the uh, searching and insertion process. Yeah, and that's all about. Um, what I have for the biological applications. Okay, um, <clears throat> so our last one is uh, parallel programming with climate models, um, specifically the uh, community earth system model. Uh, so this was created in ar around 1980s um, as both a freely available and low intensity um, global atmosphere model for use in research communities. Um, interestingly, it's also being used in a like a century long experiment on the growth of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere that started around 1998. Um, so project that to like um, 2100 something. So um, CESM turns Earth's motions and processes, uh, specifically the atmosphere, the land, the oceans, um, ice caps, into these discrete parameterized grid boxes using parallel processors. And <clears throat> And our job for the competition is to design and build a cluster that can run several of the CESM tests and will be benchmarked by our completion speed. So from some preliminary Googling, uh, we found that the applications are fairly CPU intensive. Um, and as we mentioned before, we may not have the option of choosing our hardware. Uh, so we kind of want to focus into focus our efforts into compilation. So what this means is that um, we want to find optimized compilers for the code base, which is mostly written in Fortran and C. Um, we've actually already found some of them uh, just from looking through various forums. 
and then in the event that we are allowed to choose our software uh, to choose our hardware stack, we're probably going to um, go for SIMD. So that's vector like optimized processors, um, specifically the AMD Epic 7742, um, because that has great support for vector executions. Um, <clears throat> So VJ, uh, who was our club president um, a year ago, uh, is now a graduate. Um, is now doing a graduate degree at um, <clears throat> Georgia Tech, and he's one of he's the Georgia Tech undergraduate team is also applying for SC twenty. So hopefully that means in the fall we'll both get in and we can have uh, like a cool little reunion at a competition. Um, Otherwise, thanks for having us. Um, hopefully, we'll get to meet face to face soon and get to all know each other. Uh, thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Do we have any questions for the uh, for the student team? So, Benjamin, it, I, not that we're going to do this, but do you know if they're going to let us bring our own Azure credits with us and just just like completely snow the other teams with tons of Azure credits or something? Uh, I don't think so. Um, they'll probably be providing a specific amount. Yeah. Yeah. But for at least for preparing for the competition, if we do get in, um, I know BU already offers some free Azure credits. And just by having a, a college email, we can get 100 free ones. Um, so hopefully that means we'll have enough to like set up our own test system and go through all the applications, uh, see what we can do with them before the competition starts. And is it kind of like other student competitions where you, you're just going to get a, uh, a Linux, I mean, you know, it's in the cloud, but it's a Linux box and then you're going to have to stand up mm -hmm, yeah. MPI and libraries and all that you got to do the full stack build. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> so because of the remote, it's pretty much all software we're thinking. So um, we kind of already figured we're going to use CentOS 7. Um, that was going to be our OS regardless of our hardware or software. Um, uh, and then, yeah, we found some MPI things, as you, and then as I said before, optimized compilers. I think that's what's really going to make or break the system. I had mentioned some of the prepackaged software. I don't know if you're going to have time to dig into this, but um, you know, there I know there are containers out there, for example, with Gromax pre-built and optimized, and um, Spec and um, and easy build definitely have mm -hmm. recipes for Gromax and probably the other the other software as well. I'd be curious if you do better custom building it yourselves or, or using the the pre optimized packages. Hmm. Are are those in the um the the link in the slides that you had for containers? Uh, Spac definitely is easy build isn't. So let me um I'll, I'll share I'll share some slides while we're or, or sorry I'll share some links while we're talking here. So in the past, uh, NVIDIA used to give student teams a highly tailored Linpack binary. I guess, I guess those days are gone, huh? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if anyone, had, maybe does Microsoft have uh, the optimized Linpack for Azure? I, I don't know. Yeah, as a, as a binary. <laughs> It's a good question. And and are you going to have access to GPU accelerated nodes or you, you don't even know? No clue. Um, oh, yeah, every, everything's completely new. So it's just, it's almost like we're walking in blind. And and how much notice do you have or, or you have no notice? You're going to find out what kind of node you're on during the competition. I feel like that that's probably what's yeah. going to happen. Wow. Okay. I, they're, they're probably scrambling to even get it all set up. You, know? <laughs> so, <laughs> you can't ask for too much. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy. Okay, I'm sending a few links here for, for you to take a look at. Yeah, thanks a bunch. Yep. Um, and then, I mean, if, if yeah, if you haven't used containers, I guess I'll, I'll send you a couple links there too. Um, it's going to depend what you're what you're working on though. Like if if you end up with a container that has an NVIDIA GPU, you probably want you know an NVIDIA container, and if not. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe you want something from from the community. Uh, so there's something called Docker Hub, where it's it's like GitHub, right? Except it's for full 
software containers and anyone can post something to Docker Hub. So you don't necessarily know what, what the provenance is, whether it's been built by someone who doesn't know what they're doing, but um, you know, you start searching grow max on Docker Hub, you might, you might find some stuff. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what makes SPAC different from the usual package managers? Is it really just the um, HPC optimized? Uh, yeah, so SPAC, SPAC and Easy Build are, um, I, I guess you could call them package managers, but they're source. So both of them take source packages and build them. Uh, and, that, and that could be, you know, from just a bare Linux box. It installs, you know, the Intel compilers and tools. It installs GNU compilers, whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. And then it'll build... Um, your MPI on top of that, and all the libraries, you know, um, you know, uh, open blahs, law pack, um, kind of everything you would need. Um, so, so both of the tools will do that, and then they'll build the, your actual user application, be it Grow Max or or whatever the application has to be. Um, so, so they are compiling on this that whatever you're running it on. So, if you run it on Azure with a with a Cascade Lake processor, it's gonna tune the binary for that Cascade Lake processor mm -hmm. um, versus a package manager where you know, Red Hat built it on some random Xeon box and it's, it has not been tuned with flags for the particular CPU architecture that you're running on. I see. Okay. Thanks, Elliot. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what the trade space is this year. I mean, when, when you've got uh, a dozen schools showing up with their own hardware. It's a, it's a hardware competition. But when, but when you've got a lot of people accessing the same uh, cloud, it's going to be much more of a software engineering competition. So, so I wouldn't be surprised if some school figures out some way to, to build a monolithic um, stack that somehow optimizes the non embarrassingly parallel parts of the code. It, I don't know. It's a, it'll be interesting to see what directions this goes. I know, I know the ASC student cluster competition that everybody has to use the same hardware over there, but you can go down to bare metal if you want. I mean, if you wanted to run, um, you know, if you wanted to run windows on, on their gear over there, they'd, they'd, they'd let you run native windows. If you wanted to run some other operating system beside Linux, They'd let you do that, and I don't know if you'll have, you know, I don't know if you'll be able to go down to metal on an Azure cluster, but, but it'll be interesting to see what people dream up for a for a differentiator. Um, you think you're going to have the freedom to play games with like going wide versus going deep, or you know, scale up versus scale out, like a big one big box or a whole bunch of little cheap boxes. I know people will do that with, Am with Amazon, right? Where they get the, um, uh, what's it called? You, you can oh, yeah. order preemptible, you know, you can get a whole bunch of cheap preemptible VMs and, and they might get preempted, but if they don't, they're cheap. I, I don't know how much flexibility you're gonna get. Yeah. Yeah, back, back, in, back in the hardware stack, we were thinking of um, a two node system. Um, uh, actually, I think we were gonna get one of the A the um, A one hundreds, uh, one of the Nvidia A one hundreds initially, um, but yeah. So I guess best case scenario is we basically just remake the the the, the um, two node system uh, through Azure. I think like one of the reason that two node system might work best in this case for us, because like. To be honest, we don't know how the networking is going to be set up over at the Azure. So two node is very simple. Like if you have simple link, just node to node, or else like if you have three node or four node, then it becomes pretty complex, like how we're going to set up the networking, which we might not have control over. Hey, you're right. You probably won't have control of the networking. I, I know Azure has some, some very robust systems available. The question I guess is going to be whether you get them, right? They have InfiniBand enabled instances, but you'll have to, I guess you'll have to see what they give you. <laughs> yeah. We might not even get, I mean, the thing is we might not even get whole box. We might just get that yeah. some hardware off a of VM, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we'll see. Well, Kurt, a lot of times it's about, it's about managing your workload, isn't it? Um, even, you know, in the hardware only competitions, you still have to, make sure you're planning your, your workload correctly because you can't necessarily run it all in the allotted time. Is that still gonna be a factor for, for 
for these competitions? Um, yeah, so 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 certainly ISC. <clears throat> it's all very much. You don't get to make those decisions. That's a nine to five conference. They shut the cluster off at night. But at but at SC, you you traditionally do have to decide of the five codes. What do you want to do? You do some team strategy to decide whether you want to hit it out of the park on Linpack and do terrible on everything else because you've built around Linpack. Now a lot of schools did that, and uh, and um, and they really do terrible on everything that isn't embarrassingly parallel. So so as you can see, they they kind of pick codes that stress five different layers of the of the seven layer OSI stack or 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 you know the uh, the caveat diagram for HPC you've got an embarrassingly parallel code you've got something that does streams you've got something that that kind of stresses uh matrix um we did that for a little while at HPEC uh do you remember the um basically the uh uh the um, um, uh embedded seven code i'll see if i can dig that up the the link um uh i don't think the link is still there but the codes are still there on on omg wiki so i i can dig that up in fact i'll probably do it before we log off um but they they went out of their way to to give you five codes that weren't all one type of acceleration so that people couldn't show up with a dedicated cluster of um deck alphas and and be able to to just uh, follow that path to victory on on five codes, you generally had to do really good on one code and and half and pretty well on four other codes. That's that's certainly been the Boston School approach for a while. Is is shoot for not center of mass, but slightly to the right of center and and doing doing you know the 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 benchmark codes HPCG and HPL uh, definitely skew the score results. So you do have to do well on the benchmarks, and then accelerating the the codes that that change every year. Like these are these are some unique codes that the game. That that is really your area that you can do some optimization and some some novel uh, tuning. Okay. Um, anything else that people want to plug? I know we have a couple of events that are coming up for the, the Boston Meetup group, and we'll be posting links to that. So, so take a look. Um, any other events to plug? I know, Kurt, you had links to a couple of events that are virtual events that are coming up. Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, okay. I'm not getting any sound on here. Just check. Yeah, I can hear you, Jerry. I can hear you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. And Kurt, how am I coming through on the video? I can see you okay. Okay. Could I just uh, yeah, change some of the video settings? All right. Well, thanks, Elliot. I thought we were going to have one of the other. Um, you know, the last team that went to a student cluster contest was UMass. They went to ISC last year. Yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of them have graduated. So I'm, I, I don't know if we can, can collect up on those. I, I don't know if you have any updates from them, but, but it'll, you know, maybe I can get an email from them and find out how that went a year ago. Yeah, no, I haven't. I, I don't. I don't have that. Yeah. Okay. In All the right. northeast, northeastern students want to run their own competition, but they haven't uh, they haven't been able to recover yet on their plans to do it either remotely or or maybe mm -hmm. just wait wait a semester. But, but they'll do that one of these days. Yeah. No, running events is hard, but yeah, that would, that would be fun to have a a local cluster competition. I agree. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Elliot. This was great. I'm glad we should we should do this more often. There's a, Agre there's a lot of between you know. There's a I can see that there were a couple of uh, 
uh, computer architecture guys that sat in on this tonight. So there's a lot of overlap between HPC and Linux. So yeah, um, yeah, cool. Okay, <laughs> agreed. Well, uh, we definitely have a, a speaker lined up for next week for sorry, next month in August. So I'll, I'll get that posted. And that's the, the student that was referenced down at Georgia Tech, VJ. Um, so he, he gives excellent speeches. I definitely recommend you check it out next month. Yeah, and BLU has a speaker lined up for next month as well. They, the next couple of months, they've got they've got speakers already well pre advanced signed up at, at BLU. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Again, thanks everyone. Hope you have a good evening. Uh, be well. Thank you all. Thanks. Good, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Good evening. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.